So when they turn off the music, that means the pastor gets up. Good morning, Westminster Church. I am glad to be here. I am well. Caroline and I had our boosters on Friday. I was totally laid out yesterday. Feeling good today. Um, Tom McMeekin is doing much better. Some of you may have heard that he was in the hospital this week. Um, he was definitely off last week. Some of you um, may have noticed that he didn't read the scripture passage before his sermon. He did not know that he did that or didn't do that. He had no idea. He had a fever of 101.7 last week. Didn't know it. Because he, he told you he had a rough night with his security alarm going off and the police and everything else. Um, turns out he had a kidney stone. It was not COVID, was not viral. He had a kidney stone, which they determined was one half inch in diameter, which I guess if you have kidney stones, I've never had them, is huge. He ended up, uh, let's see, Monday or Tuesday was 104.7, then 104.8. So he went to the hospital, I think Wednesday, and spent Wednesday night in the emergency room all night because they couldn't find a room. And then uh, he got in a room, they loaded him up with antibiotics. And um, let me think. I, I get my days mixed up. He did come home on Friday, but they, and Tom told me, he said, give him as much information as you like. If they're kind enough to give me all the details about their lives, I have to do the same. Um, they put a stent in, in the, and I'm not licensed to practice medicine in the state of Pennsylvania. The kidney stone was in front of the outlet for the kidney, the, the exit, whatever. They moved the kidney stone out of the way and they loaded him up with antibiotics and they put a stent in to improve the flow to flush the kidney, it's his left kidney. So he's on antibiotics, a very powerful antibiotic, twice a day. He goes back in two weeks for them to go back in and remove the kidney. And then after another week, he goes back in and they remove the stent. Stone. stone. No, stent, no, they remove the, uh, remove the stone, thank you. Yeah, yeah, make sure we get this right. They go back in two weeks to remove the stone and then go back in a week later to remove the stent. So he's feeling much better. Um, I've never had a kidney stone. I've talked to women who say it's worse than giving birth. And I pray that I don't know what causes them. You know, people always say, well, he probably drinks too much beer, right? So, and back. For the first time in two years, the Westminster United Presbyterian Church Choir. I said this my first week, I'll say it again. When I was in seminary, I asked my pastor, how do you worship? You're working on Sunday morning. I said, you're in the zone. And he said, well, he said, when the choir sings, I sit back and I relax and I'd let the word of God wash over me, and that's when I worship. And then when they're done, I have to tighten the chain, he said. I have to pull on the chain and get back to work. So I thank you very much for ministering to me, and next week to Lizzie, if you're here. If you're here, she'll be here. Thank you for your ministry to pastors, because you are how we worship. Another important thing with the choir, the most important thing, of course you gotta hit the notes, these folks believe the words that they sing. They believe the words that they sing. This isn't like Barbara Streisand singing Christmas carols. <laughs> right? Because she's Jewish. Your choir believes the words that they sing, and therefore the Holy Spirit, they are vessels and outlets for the Holy Spirit. So we thank you, I thank you very much for your ministry to, to me, to all of us, and to this great church. Thank you for your service. Um, transition team report while I'm here. Don't forget to fill out the leadership competency survey. In the back is a large doc, three pages, with 
33 leadership competencies. What kind of characteristics do you think your next pastor should have? Preaching and worship leadership, uh, strategic decision-making, financial, technical, communicating, willing to engage conflict. There's a handful of them. So far, seven have turned in. Maybe there's some in the box, but take a survey, fill it out. I think this week or next week is the deadline. We're patient. The transition team continues to work. They hope to have the self-study finished by late November, mid-November, and we will probably elect the pastor nominating committee, and you will probably elect the PNC in January. Um, if you think God is calling you to be on the pastor nominating committee, talk to me or Tom or one of the transition team members or to Matt DeFries, who else is on the church nominating committee? Steve Hughes, Jeff McGill, talk to them. If you feel like you're at a Billy Graham crusade being lifted out of your seat to be, pil to be on the PNC. It's a lot of work, but there's no more important committee in the life of the church. So thank you very much. Um, I'll be better in about an hour. And now our call to worship. Will you rise and join me in the call to worship? Listen, all who are fleeing from the Holy One, God is calling us. God has called us together. Oh, give, give thanks, thanks to God, for, for God, God is good. God's, God's steadfast love endures forever. God is eager to put loving arms around us. God is waiting to satisfy our hunger and thirst. God fills the hungry with good things. Our thirsting souls are filled to overflowing. Set your minds on things that are above. Put to death your earthly disobedience. God leads us to a new identity, to new life. We seek renewal in the image of our Creator. Will you remain standing and join in singing from the blue hymnal number 555? Now we thank, I'm sorry, now thank we all our God.
If we say we have no sin, the truth is not in us. We deceive ourselves. But if we confess our sin, God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us pray together our prayer of confession. Holy God, God, our our lives lives are are far from from holy. The The thoughts we have held in secret have have erupted erupted into hurtful words and deeds. We We have have not avoided lies and slander. slander. We have given in to pessimism and suspicion. We resent people whose lives seem easier than our own. We hate the thought of passing on to those less worthy the things we have worked so hard to possess. O God, we need your wisdom in order to live peacefully within ourselves. Amen. And now let us take a moment and silently confess our sin before God. My friends, the psalmist declares, the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always accuse, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. And as far as the east is from the west, so far he has removed our transgressions from us. My friends, believe the good news of the gospel. I declare to you, in the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen and amen. Our first scripture reading this morning is Psalm 33. Rejoice in the Lord, O ye righteous. Praise befits the upright. Praise the Lord with a lyre. Make melody to him with a harp of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully on the strings with loud shouts. For the word of the Lord is upright and all his work is done in faithfulness. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the steadfast love of the Lord. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and all their host by the breath of his mouth. He gathered the waters of the sea as in a bottle. He put the depths in storehouses. Excuse me. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the wor- world stand in awe of him. For he spoke, and it came to be. He commanded, and it stood firm. The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He frustrates the plans of the peoples. The counsel of the Lord stands forever the thoughts of his heart to all generations. Happy is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people whom he has chosen as his heritage. The Lord looks down from the heaven. He sees all humankind. From where he sits enthroned, he watches all the inhabitants of the earth. He who fashions the hearts of them all and observes all their deeds. A king is not saved by his great army. A warrior is not delivered by his great strength. 
The war horse is a vain hope for victory, and by its great might it cannot save. Truly the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his steadfast love, to deliver their soul from death and keep them alive in famine. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and shield. Our heart is glad in him because we trust in his holy name. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us, even as we hope in you. May God add his blessing to the reading of this word.
if your mom has ever shared the stories with you about how our mom, your Grammy, would have these wonderful science experiments. Did she ever tell you about those? No. 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 Okay, well, let me tell you about them because they're pretty cool. <clears throat> so our mother was quite the character. Um, and her science experiments were very basic. Um, the one was a Twinkie, still in the wrapper, that she kept on her desk in her office. And um, Amanda, how long did, was it there? Five years? Approximately five plus years. Sitting there, she, she was, her experiment was, how long could she keep it in the wrapper on her desk before it molded? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, when we had to clean out her office, um, after she went to the nursing home, it was still there. And um, it still was edible, maybe. Um, so we just kind of file 13 to that one. But there were other ones that she would do in our house. And that's when, you know, you'd open your refrigerator and you'd find food that was left over from two or three weeks ago, and it had stuff growing on it. And, like, have you found that at home? No. no. What about you? Not yet? Mm. <laughs> well, you know, I looked this morning for some in ours, but I didn't see any science experiments, which is, which is a good thing. I have a whole kit if you want some. Oh, uh, yes, I know, sweet pea. <clears throat> so... The scripture this morning that Pastor Jim is going to be speaking on is about the parable of the rich fool. Now, this man, wanted, in the scripture, tells us that he wants to build really big barns to house all of this crops that he's going to raise. And he wants to store them for a long time because, you know, he's rich and he thinks that he needs it all. So what's going what's to happen is, is, do you think like all this grain is going to stay fresh, like you can eat it five, ten years later like the Twinkie? Or do you think like the food in the refrigerator that's spoiled and growing things, what do you think? Okay. I'm really not sure. Are you really not sure? Okay. Well, what about you? Right. Right. So you don't think it'll last? You know, I think you're right. I don't think the grain's going to last as long as he thinks it's going to. So what do you think this man should do with it instead of storing it up for himself? Give it to others. Give it to others? You know what? I, I think you're right. Because this, this foolish man thinks that he can keep all this stuff for himself and that it's going to be there forever. And in, in the story, in the parable that Jim's going to read in a few minutes, the man, the man actually dies that night. So he doesn't get to build his barns. And he doesn't get to keep his grains. So if we have an overabundance of something, should we keep it for ourselves? Because we know we're, no. We should share it, shouldn't we? Yeah. All right. Shall we pray? God, help us to see in our abundance how we can share with others around us not only the things that we have, but the love that you have given to us so that we can share it with others. Amen.
Please be seated. Now I have to remember that every so often to turn around and look, look at you guys. Let us pray. Lord God, thank you for this day. Thank you for this great body of Christ. And Lord God, thank you for your word. And Father God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. This week's passage is a parable from Jesus. Many of you know, as Lizzie said, the parable of the rich fool. This passage is from Luke chapter 12. Many of you know about parables. Parables are a story that someone will offer that allows us to come alongside the characters and the events in the story. And then suddenly we're brought into the story and a point is made. We're convicted. An illustration is made. There are hundreds of parables in Scripture not just Jesus and his dozens of parables. Um, I have a book which I made up, I said before I did something else this morning, a guy named Warren Wiersbe wrote many books, and one of his books is All the Parables in the Bible. And um, I said, I need to bring that just to show the congregation. Well, then I was doing something else and I forgot. A well-known parable in the Old Testament is when Nathan, the prophet Nathan, uh, confronts and convicts David after his affair with Bathsheba. Nathan comes to David, and David is sitting on his throne, and he tells him the story about a, a poor farmer who lived in a small town, and they had a, they had a lamb as a pet. And the lamb was basically a member of the family. The children played with the little lamb, And there was a rich king in the area who was entertaining a guest and they needed a meal for the the guest. And he went and he took this lamb from this poor farmer and they had lamb for the meal. And David was outraged. What a terrible thing. That man needs to die. He's a terrible person. And Nathan says, you are the man. Nathan told David a parable about this terrible guy. And if you look up Psalm 51, which you often read on Ash Wednesday, create in me a clean heart, O God, it says in the superscript, written by David after he was confronted by Nathan after his affair with Bathsheba. Another parable. Parables are to make one or two points maximum. You don't have the entire sweep of Christian theology illustrated in a parable. During Jesus' time, rabbis or teachers would often sit in a public place and hold discussions about the issues of the day on matters of religion or ethics. In our account this morning, Jesus is speaking to a crowd, and lo and behold, someone interrupts him. So let's get to the passage, Luke chapter 12 at verse 13. I will, the way I do sermons, just as a piece of information, is I'll read a few verses and then talk about it, then read a few more. It's called expository preaching. PNC members, think about that when you interview your next pastor. Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide my in- the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Now let's not get too excited with, about Jesus and his calling man. It doesn't, it's not a snide remark or anything. You remember... The first miracle in scripture in Jesus' time, the uh, turning the water into wine, when Mary says to Jesus, they've run out of wine, and he says, woman, my time has not yet come. You know, it's not like a husband these days in a fit of anger might say to his wife, woman, you know, that, (laughs) how, how, how many does that really work, right? The person who identified Jesus as teacher would naturally expect Jesus to have the ability to render a judgment on ethical matters. Rabbis were often thus consulted, and in later years, some traveled from place to place to render opinions or legal decisions. Jesus' refusal to answer the brother's question is not a denial of his right or ability to settle the dispute. 
Instead, Jesus turns directly to an area which others have no right to judge. The question of motivation. What was motivating the brother? We are not told whether the angry brother had legal justification for his request of Jesus. Jesus knew the issue was about covetousness, coveting. So he addressed the problem of coveting, not the symptom. Covetous is the desire for things, and it can be the beginning of all kinds of sin. Eve coveted being like God and took the forbidden fruit. Lot's wife coveted Sodom and was killed on the spot, turned into a pillar of salt. David, as I just mentioned, coveted his his neighbor's wife and plunged himself, his family, and his nation into trouble. For me, it's a 1963 Impala SS convertible, four-speed transmission, 409 cubic inch V8. I looked one up the other day, it's $99,000. That's ridiculous, it doesn't even have a basement. (laughs) Now, it hasn't ruined my life, it's just one of those things, I go to the cruises, I actually said to a guy, there was a guy who had a black-on-black hardtop. Uh, everything was original. And I said, this is my favorite car in the show. And he, tears came to his eyes. Uh, I know very well about that. My son has uh, been a Volkswagen nut for years. And it's like if there's a hole in the ground and you just continually, unless it's an Auburn Cord or a Duesenberg or something really, or maybe a Bugatti, it's a hole in the ground, Right? Not to be disrespectful of anyone who invests in something like that, I, it's a lot of work. The tenth commandment is, is, our last commandment is, thou shalt not covet. By coveting, it's easy for us to break the other nine. Think about it. So Jesus turns a question into an opportunity to minister to this person's underlying needs, covetousness. Now to the parable. Jesus said to him, Jesus said to them, remember he's speaking to a crowd, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. The man thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to the man, you fool. This this very night your life will be demanded of you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself but is not rich towards God. As I said, Jesus speaks to the entire crowd, not just the two brothers. He takes the opportunity to address what our attitudes about material things should be. The issue revolves around the very issue of life. What is our life? The reason there is a 10th commandment, thou shalt not covet, because coveting, we all experience the sin of covetousness. We all experience the sin of greed. Greed seeks possessions of things, but these possessions of thing and things are not the same as living. In fact, If left unchecked, things will become a substitute for the proper object of our search and worship, God. Listen to Colossians 3, 5. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. I read this week about a Roman proverb. Money is like seawater. 
The more you drink, the thirstier you become. In our parable this morning, this certain rich man, as Jesus said, illustrates the attitude Jesus discerns not only in the brother who asked the question, but also in others. Gosh, maybe this parable is speaking to us. I didn't mention it. Was anyone counting? In the man's word to himself, verses 7 through 19, there are 11 personal pronouns. 11. How many of us have done the same? We sit back with our feet up, hands behind our head, and we congratulate ourselves. Look how my hard work has finally paid off. Look how much I've been able to accomplish. Am I great or what? And what does God say to the rich man? You fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? In the parable, God God calls the man a fool. This is not to be taken lightly. The word describes anyone who rejects the knowledge and precepts of God as a basis for life. The word fool, foolish, foolishness appears in 78 verses in Scripture. That's the benefit of Bible works. How about this well-known saying? A fool and his money are soon parted. I won't ask for a show of hands, those of you who think that's in the Bible. It is not. It's not. A fool and his money are soon parted comes from a quote, is a proverb found in the poem 500 Points of Good Husbandry by Tom Tusser. It's like the, uh, the, the, the one, God helps those who help themselves. I'll never forget, I remember sitting in the seminary class with my friend Colleen, who's now at the uh, Carnegie Church, and, one of the, and the professor said, well, everyone knows God helps those who help themselves isn't in Scripture. And she gasped because she thought it was one of those that's... Now, do unto others, that's in Acts where Paul refers to it. Jesus never said that himself. These are things. In the opening letter of his, uh, to, the, to the church at uh, uh, Galatia, Paul rails against, he says, you foolish Galatians, who seduced you? The one letter where he's not very nice in his opening remarks. Great book. But in our parable this morning, this is the only time in Scripture where God actually calls somebody a fool, even though it's in a parable. You fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? The rich man never saw beyond himself. He was aggressively self-centered. He lived for himself, he talked for himself, he planned for himself, and he congratulated himself. Second, he never saw beyond this world. All his plans were made on the basis of life in this world. His sudden death proved that he had lived as a fool. We all say we want just enough, but we never know how much is enough until we have too much. By the way, Tom's title, if he had preached, same passage. I looked at what he was preaching. I thought, well, I'll give that a shot. But Tom's title was, When is Enough Enough? Um, Do we ever ever worry we won't have enough? By the way, in the first three weeks of November, uh, I will be preaching three stewardship sermons. Stewardship, three weeks on stewardship. I thought we just had one sermon on the amount. Think about your life in Christ. And do I have enough? Or am I so worried that I'm living my life with one hand behind my back just to be sure? Think about that. Do we ever worry we won't have enough? As we go through life collecting our things along the way, are we anxious? I tell a story. Uh, Peter DeVries is the pastor at the Old Union Church, and about two or three years ago, they had a Kenyan seminary, a seminary student from Kenya worship with them for a year. And as you head towards Mars on Mars Evan City Road, you go by that place on the right that has all those storage places. So this Kenyan student says to Peter, 
What are all those buildings on the right? And Peter says, well, that's, um, those are buildings where people keep their stuff. And this young man from Africa, what, 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 what do you mean their stuff? Well, we have a lot of stuff and we have, to, we, we have so much stuff, we have to keep it someplace else. And Peter, he said, I was convicted, you know, because we have our stuff and we have so much that we got to rent a place to keep our stuff just to make sure we have enough. In telling of the parable, Jesus emphasizes that this anxiety reflects a lack of trust in God. Such anxiety is not productive. It cannot add one width, 18 inches, or a single cubit to one's height. Imagine if our anxiousness, the more we were worried and got anxious, it added height for us, we'd each be over 10 feet tall. Jesus says, watch out, be on guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. The covetous person thinks only of the abundance of things or the things he does not have. The younger brother thought his troubles would be over if he only received his share of the inheritance. Of course, God is concerned for us. God tells us not to worry. He's concerned that we are provided for. But by themselves, things cannot make one any happier. This parable can be used as a spiritual inventory for us to examine our hearts. When we look at the material things that we have, what is our response? Do we see God? Or are we like the rich man, the rich fool, who sees only for himself? The rich man did not see the hand of God. He saw only himself. The fact that he had, had had such a rich harvest did not make him a better person necessarily. It simply demonstrated that God had been kind and gracious to him or had given him the gift of, I, I call it the gift of agriculture. He'd had a green thumb. He produced a great crop. Many of us use our life skills, our God-given skills, to, to work, produces wealth, things, we have gifts. The material blessings of our life are either a mirror in which we see ourselves, or they're a window, a window through which we see God. Either a mirror where we see ourselves or a window through which we see God. So tonight your life will be demanded of you. What if tonight was the night? What would God say about your life? Have your life and your heart been full of self-congratulation? Is your arm sore from patting yourself on the back? Have things become your God? If we think more about our car or our home, vacation, bank account, appearance, investments, if we think about these things more than God, then you are serving, we are serving mammon and building up treasure on earth. You know, we've all heard of that or seen the bumper sticker, who, he who dies with the most toys wins. But you're still dead, right? Jesus loves us, but every so often we need to be hit right between the eyes. This is such a time. This is what the passage Tom was going to preach. This parable is not so we can feel good about ourselves. One thing, um, again, I'm only few, uh, here a few times. Uh, I've said in other churches, if I make you mad, I will apologize. But if God convicts you, that is not my problem. You give the pastor the authority to deliver God's word. And you have to trust and give that authority to the pastor that he or she, no pressure next week, Lizzie, he or she will deliver God's word whatever he or she believes God wants him or her to say. This parable is not so we can feel good about ourselves. 
It's meant to wake us up, perhaps even shock us. Live your life as if today was the last day. At the end of your life, you will say, thank you, God, for giving me everything. Speaking personally, for 27 years, I fought going to seminary because I wouldn't make enough money. And uh, finally, in 2001, I didn't have any choice. I lost my job. God convicted me. Okay. Kicking and screaming. And um, it's, it's a fraction of what I made before but it's been one of the greatest rides of my life, good and bad. Um, your minister, ministers do not do this for the money. They do it for the blessings that they get. And by the way, um, I'm so happy to be in this great church. You guys are doing great. Maybe there's conflict, I haven't seen it. Uh, it's really, a, you're really a healthy, calm, uh, ble- this is a blessed church. Blessed church. I'm, I, I, believe me, I've seen everything. But I'm glad to be here. Live your life as it was the last day. At the end of your life, will you say, thank you, God, for giving me everything, everything I needed, not necessarily I wanted. I mean, I'd have to spend another, I mean, I'd have to have a garage or a shop. And you can't drive that 63 Impala every day. It's only on perfectly dry days. You can't take it out. And um, you got to find somebody to fix it. Yeah. My son's 72 Volkswagen bus is, at least it's in a garage now. Or will you lie in your expensive bed and say, so what? So my friends, this is how it will be for anyone. That includes me and us who stores up things for himself is not, and is not rich for God. Let's pray. Lord God, Jesus convicts us. We stand convicted because none of us is perfect. All of us are full of sin and we are greedy. We covet. We're envious. We're jealous. But Lord God, help us whatever condition we're in, good or bad, rich or poor, working towards some goal or having reached that goal, whatever that goal is. Lord God, thank you for everything you've given to us in your measure. You give us what we need. Let us be happy with that. And Lord God, as Lizzie said to the kids, let us not store up to keep things because even that Twinkie goes bad. And what happens if this was our last day on earth? Lord God, Convict us and help us live better lives. And let us pray that we know when we have enough. Whatever you give us is enough because you know what we need. Thank you for this word. Thank you for convicting us. And thank you for your son in whose name we pray. Amen. Many of you know that our Constitution of the Presbyterian Church has two volumes. Volume two is our Book of Order, which has our polity and our rules and regulations. Volume one is our Book of Confessions. We in the Presbyterian Church USA have, I think, what is now 13 confessions. And what my habit has been, my practice has been, is every week, a lot of material in the Book of Confessions, I find a paragraph or so connected to the sermon. Because sometimes when you go through the Apostles' Creed every week, you just kind of uh, uh, you learn something new. So if you are able, please rise and let us affirm our faith from the larger catechism. What are the duties required in the Tenth Commandment? The duties duties required in the the 10th commandment are such a full contentment with our our own condition and and such a charitable frame of the whole soul towards our our neighbor neighbor, as as that that all our inward inward motions and affections affections touching him tend tend unto and further all that good which is his. 
Please be seated. So continued prayers for Tom. You may have noticed I recorded the anthem on my phone. Now, one thing I don't know how to do is to resize the file to send it to him because it was too big. Again, I'm, maybe someone can help me. But Tom is, uh, is grateful for your prayers and your support. Um, he will not be here next week. He's traveling to Wisconsin, I think, for a, fa- a memorial service for a family member who died a while ago. Reverend Wolf will be offering the word, and I'm looking forward to what God wants her to say. And she'll be looking forward to that too, right? Others? Joys and concerns? In the back. Thank you, Lou. Okay, so my, um, my boss and my mentor at work is having surgery on Thursday to remove a melanoma, and this is probably her third or fourth that she's had removed, so I would cover your prayers for her that this is successful and that this is the last one that they find because, yes, I need a job. Thank you. <laughs> and your boss's name? Lori. Lori. Yeah. No, she's a wonderful, wonderful person. Thank you, choir. Continue to pray for your choir. Not that they, I mean, it's not not like they're in desperate straits and they need prayer, but just prayers of affirmation. We have empty seats. Oh, yeah, by the way, look, there are no auditions, right? And it's not like, I, I could never be in that choir. You don't even have to read music. You, you don't, just music. have half a clue when the notes go up on the page, your voice goes up. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and don't be intimidated. Um, right? They were, and that's, you know, choirs are great. I wish I, I, I can't, I know I said I wanted to join, but it's just, you feel like a one-armed paper hanger being in the choir. I know Tom, Tom Harmon was in the choir. He's a lot younger than me also, so... If you'd like to join Wednesday nights at seven, seven o'clock. Ah, uh, every other Wednesday. That's even easier, folks. Other joys and concerns? Let's go to God in prayer. Lord God, thank you for this day. Thank you that you are God. Lord God, thank you that you created the heavens and the earth, and yet you you count the hairs on our head. A sparrow doesn't fall from the sky without you knowing about it. Lord God, we admit that it's a most audacious thing that we can come to you and call you Father. And yet we are your children because of the life and death and resurrection of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you that we can come to you in prayer. Thank you for the body of Christ called Westminster Church. Thank you for all the workers who serve tirelessly, who live out their faith in this place to bring glory to you. Again, we confess that we are not even worthy to lift up our faces to you, and yet your face shines upon our faces. Lord God, we lift, up, we lift up Pastor Tom, a, one of the finest men I've ever met in my life. It's been my joy to, war, to serve alongside him. He is a good guy and a man of Christ, and he is getting better because of your hand. Thank you that you give doctors and nurses and technicians and everyone else brains to work on the human body. That we're able now to go inside of a human kidney and remove a stone. Thank you for people who develop medicines, for people like Tom and others. Many of us are on a pile of medicines, Lord God, that you give us brains to create pharmaceuticals to heal people. 
But in all this, behind all this, is your loving and healing touch. And thank you for your healing touch of, upon our friend, our pastor, Tom. Give him strength this week so he can get to his memorial service for a family member and keep him safe as he travels. Lord God, we ask you to let your loving hand this week come on Lori as she faces surgery. Let your light shine in the operating theater. Hold her in your loving arms during this procedure. Bring her out of the anesthetic softly and gently and back to health so she can get back to her workplace. Lord God, thank you for all the work that is done here in this place again. Thank you for those who are here. Thank you for those who are not here. Keep them safe. Let them be lifted up if they see this message online. Continue to bless our leaders. Be with our, our transition team. Lord God, you know who the pastor is for this great church. We don't know, and that person doesn't know, but Lord God, in your time, make it perfectly clear to us whom you have called to be the pastor of this great church. But in the meantime, keep us together and let us have our eyes on you. Lord God, we are a nation in tension, in turmoil. We disagree. There is violence. Lord God, heal us. Bring us together. Let civility come back into our society. Let us get along with one another. We disagree, of course, but let us disagree in a Christian way. If we disagree, let us be respectful and civil to each other. Lord God, it would be great if a world existed where there was no need for military or police. Lord God, let your peace reign. Bring us together, bring us back, keep us safe. Continue to bless what we do. Bless our nation, bless those in uniform. And Lord God, let your peace reign over all the world. And now we lift our voices to you in unison, praying the prayer your son taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now let us give back to God his tithes and our offerings.
Lord God, thank you. Thank you for all you have given to us freely and lovingly, without condition. Our homes, our families, our work, our church. Lord God, let, this, let these gifts be a sign of our thanks. And let them be used here and throughout the world that others might come to know the grace that comes only through your Son. We lift all this up in his name. Amen. Please be seated. As I said, Tom will be gone next week. Lizzie will be preaching. Uh, session meets after worship. Others entering the mission field. I know we would have had a great time last night. It would have been a little chilly at the bonfire. I think we'll try to reschedule the bonfire. The operative word was postponed. <laughs> but we've got to look at the Steelers' schedule. Maybe. It's important to some of us. Others? Um, we will be collecting frostings and cake mixes for the food bank for Thanksgiving, um, their Thanksgiving baskets. So uh, we actually, their uh, families participating are down, um, which is a good thing. Um, so we will only need to collect 30 of each. So that is uh, cake mixes and frostings, just like we've done before. And that, I think that'll go through, uh, I think their, collect, or their distribution is on November 20th, so I'll need to take it over prior to that. So you can check your calendar, but we have a few weeks to do that. So we'll collect them, put them on the table in the chapel back here. Good morning. Just a reminder, once again, we still have the opportunity to do the BRIC campaign, so anybody who's looking to honor or memorialize an individual or loved one, there are forms in the back, as well as in the back of the sanctuary. Also, we will begin soon to post the gift tags for the toy drive. That is going to be on Saturday, December 11th, which means our collection will end on Sunday, December the 5th. Uh, once again, we'll be able to accept gift cards or um, newly uh, purchased gifts for teenagers. So more to come. Those gift tags should be arriving soon. We'll have the tree up here in a couple weeks. Thanks. I also have one. Um, we're going to be away for Thanksgiving, so we need to try to find somebody we can train up on the video system if we can find that. If not, we just won't be able to have a video posted online. We are getting 10 to 20 hits a week on the video online, so it is something that people are joining us online to worship with us. So I believe it's important. Thank you. And thank you for your service. It's invaluable. What's one outcome of this terrible pandemic is churches large and small are realizing that they need to be an online presence. And the word, um, the word spreads. So it's one silver lining in a cloud that's been over us for 18 months is that more people are able to hear the word. Still got to be in church. It's much better being here live. Others? Tom, Jim, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. Um, in two weeks, on the 31st, we will be doing the celebration of the faithful. So we will be remembering and honoring uh, our members who have joined the church triumphant in this past year. So we would like to ask everybody to attend that. Um, I would like to give a big thank you to Luann for doing the prayer chain and the weekly update. And to Jesse Gladstone for doing the Facebook postings. You guys have been wonderful, and I thank you for that. And also a thank you to, and I call this a team, the team that does the PowerPoint. Dan, Sue, Vicki, and Bonnie. Um, it, it's, it is a, it, it's a work, and everybody has their little thing to do, and they've done a wonderful job. So thank you, guys. Let's sing our final hymn.
and now receive the benediction, and now may the grace of our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, the love of our Father God, and the power and communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen and amen.